Good morning. Good morning for people in the Netherlands. Good afternoon or selamat siang for people in Indonesia. Welcome to the third session of INTPF 2021 Indonesia Netherlands Technology Partnership Forum on EV Charging. This session is organized by Institut Teknologi Bandung Alumni Association in the Netherlands uh, or Netherlands chapter EITB NL in collaboration with the Indonesian Embassy in The Hague supported by Energy Academy Indonesia or ECADI. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, making time to come to this event. I hope you're well, especially for those joining from Indonesia, considering the COVID situation there. I hope things get better soon. And more importantly, I hope you and your family and friends stay safe and healthy. My name is Mutia, and I'm honored to be here with all the distinguished speakers, and I'll be your moderator for today. A bit of me, uh, I'm a professional working in an energy company in the Netherlands. Uh, today, I'm here in my capacity as one of the ITB alumni. So all my questions and comments do not represent the views of my employer. Before we start, let's do some quick housekeeping. Uh, the third session will be different from the previous session as we wanna make this session more interactive. So you can expect that this session will look like a talk show with a storyline to tell. Um, we will have two sessions with a 10 minute break in between. So the first session will focus on the enabler of the success of EV charging penetration. And the second session will focus on the blockers and what to do next, right? Are we going to do any collaboration? What do we need to be able to learn from, uh, from the Netherlands and replicate the same, the same success? I would encourage you to take part throughout the session. You can still submit your questions, although this is um, a more like a talk show like via YouTube chat or Zoom chat by addressing your questions to the INTPF Q&A account. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers for today. Our first speaker is Sonia Munix. So Sonia Munix is a, is a senior advisor with 20 years of experience in the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, or in Dutch we call it RVO, uh, who has been working on stimulating e-mobility in, in the Netherlands and internationally for more than 10 years today. She studied international business, international management, and Japanese studies from the Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Through her experience today, we will learn about the secret recipe behind the success of EV charging penetration in the Netherlands. Please welcome Sonia Munix. Thank you, Sonia, for being here with us. Thank you very much, Mutia. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you. Our second speaker is Kuh Noyens. Uh, Kuh Noyens is a professional with over 10 years of experience in strategic policy and advocacy in the European energy policy legislation. His mission is to promote the acceleration of electric mobility. He is currently living his mission, so lucky him, leading EVbox European policy work to bring smart and scalable charging solutions in Europe. The discussion with him today will enrich our discussion from a European industry player point of view. Please welcome Kuh Noyens. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here today in this important forum. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Kuhn. Um, our next speaker is Miss Ida Nuryatin Finahari. Uh, Ida Nuri Ibu, Ibu Ida Nuryatin Finahari, we can call her Ibu Ida, is one of Indonesia's high profile women in energy. She's the director of electricity business fostering at the Directorate General for Electricity. Today, Ibu Ida represents the Indonesian Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources uh, because Mr. Rida Muliana can't be here with us due to unforeseen circumstances. Ibu Ida gained her bachelor's degree in chemical engineer engineering from Institute Technology 10 November Surabaya and she completed her master's degree from Tokyo University of Agricul Agriculture and Technology in Applied Chemistry. Thank you very much, Ibu Ida. I hope you, you're well and family too in Indonesia. It's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thank you, Mutia, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all. So having uh, introduced all the speakers, I would like to open uh, this webinar. So maybe just to break the ice a little bit, right? Because it's of course for the speakers after they are being introduced, you feel a bit nervous probably. So first, let, let, let's break the ice a little bit. Let me first ask you a, a question before we start our session on EV, EV charging. So just a short, I, I, I want a short answer for, from you 
is your car currently electric? And would the reason whether your car electric or not was because uh, the existing the existence of EV charging uh, facility? So Sonia, maybe you can start. Yes, I'm sorry, but my current car is not electric um, because my mother lives uh, quite far away and mm -hmm. I need to be able to visit her. And at the moment, only expensive cars can do that for me. And as a government official, of course, I do, do not make so much money. So that's not <laughs> yet possible. But my next car definitely will be electric. All right. And how about you, Kun? Well, yeah, indeed, I, I have an electric car. So uh, we do live by our mission. So uh, I, <laughs> I'm, uh, I have the opportunity to go wherever I want to go with the with elect with electric car. And, well, since electricity is everywhere, it's it's somehow easy to, to tap into the networks and and get everywhere. So that's so that's good. Awesome, living the mission. And how about Ibu Ida? Probably it's different because in Indonesia, I don't know how many cars do we have uh, EV cars we have. So uh, how uh, how about you? Yes, uh, I don't have uh, electric electric cars, but uh, Indonesia have. Uh, huge of target uh, electric car uh, in Indonesia and right now uh, we will uh, develop uh, electric car uh, very 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 much yeah so very uh, yeah uh, we have a huge target right and then we will go yeah. there somehow. all right so whatever you, the the answer is whether we you have ev cars or not i think ev charging discussion is still relevant and then we're happy today to uh, to facilitate this discussion so i think i would like to start first as the title say a tale of two countries i would like to first learn from the netherlands we have sonia munich here so let me first ask the first question about how does the car and ev charging landscape look like in the netherlands today. Would you be able to share something about that, uh, Sonia? Yes, thank you, Mircea. Uh, Ferry, could you please start my slides? Yes, because I prepared a few slides because it's easier to look at because I'm talking about numbers. So it's easier to look at some slides. Uh, the next one, please, uh, Ferry. So here you can see a chart of the registrations over time of electric vehicles um, from 2010 up to now, and you can see um, a gradual uh, rise in uh, electric vehicles. The dark green is uh, battery electric vehicles, so fully electric. The light green are plug-in hybrids. And you can see we used to be a plug-in hybrid country, but now we are more a battery electric vehicle country. And this has all to do with our incentives, uh, mostly. Uh, so next slide, please, uh, Ferdi. So here you can see a more, uh, some more data. In the top, you can see we have about 185,000 uh, full electric vehicles at the moment, and about 115,000 plug-in hybrids. And it's about three point, it's about three and a half percent of our total fleet now, which is electric. So that's either battery electric or fuel cell electric, but those are still very limited, or plug-in hybrids. In the below, you can see the market share of sales. And um, at the moment in total, it's about 8% um, is battery electric and 10 is plug-in hybrid. Uh, but so in general, it's, uh, well, it's quite a high average uh, in new sales. And to the uh, right, you can see uh, the card of the, 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 the map of the Netherlands with the charging points in there. And you can see it's about regular and fast charging points. And you can see the division over the different provinces that we have. And currently we have about 70,000 uh, public or semi-public charging points uh, in the Netherlands. The next one, please. And uh, this one, I put in this slide to give you a bit of perspective because uh, it shows the electric car registrations in major markets in 2020. It's data by the IEA. You can see, of course, China is uh, uh, has been far ahead all the time, but you actually can also see uh, that in um, in 2020 in Europe, we had the highest uh, share of electric vehicles uh, being sold. And in the bottom, you can see a few graphs, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Norway. Those are the top three countries in Europe. You can see, well, 
uh, how it's done there. And you can also see that if you look at the share, so that's the line graph, that Norway is way ahead of everyone else. Um, and the, But then the next one, it shows you the chargers uh, across Europe. The next slide, please, uh, Ferdi. This gives you uh, some idea of the distribution of electric car charging points, but it's public chargers, uh, these data. And you can see that, um, well, one third of all chargers in Europe are in the Netherlands. And indeed, 70% are just in three countries, the Netherlands, France, and Germany. So in Europe, we also have quite a challenge still to face, even in the Netherlands, uh, that is. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this is all some dry data. It's a bit difficult to maybe get an idea of how electric transport is doing in the Netherlands. So I have a short video to show you as my next um, answer to your question. Um, and that gives you an idea of how things are, are doing here. Okay, so I'm uh, looking forward to see the video. Um, maybe someone in our team can share the video from Airveo. <laughs> To preserve planet Earth, we need to change the energy and mobility system worldwide. The Dutch are accustomed at transforming big challenges into great opportunities. We share knowledge, encourage easy use, support entrepreneurship and connect sciences. We are committed to zero emission mobility. Transition starts with ambition. The Dutch ambition is to extend our leading position in the field of zero emission transport further. To inspire and motivate others in taking the road to zero emission and to accelerate along it. As a result, the Netherlands has one of the densest charging networks in the world. And we're one of the leading players in electric transport not only in the rollout of passenger cars and electric buses, but also in charging infrastructure and the new development of new technologies and services. Many foreign-built charging poles have Dutch technology inside. We invented seamless charging services and open protocols and export them worldwide. Something to be proud of, we think. Dutch startups have global influence on new technology development, increasing efficiency and reducing costs. It's through the spirit of the next generation that we find new ways to grow. The key success factors are cooperation, knowledge development and regional anchoring. A number of Dutch cities are working towards zero emission zones to support the rollout of clean modes of transport. The introduction of renewable sustainable city distribution will help to make our cities smarter and greener. We strongly believe in working together. That's why, amongst others, the Dutch government works via public-private partnerships. Together we can find the right solutions that make a sustainable difference. Join us on our journey to a zero emission future. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sonia, for uh, sharing uh, the video. I think I really like it, especially when it mentioned transition starts with ambition, right? And also I see how it translates to the numbers of EV, both EV chargings and EV cars in the Netherlands. So my question to you now, to get to those numbers, um, I'm curious, what are the enablers, right? Is it fair to say that policy and government support contributed extensively to the penetration of EV charging in the Netherlands? Thank you, Mujia. Mujia. Yes, uh, I think you can say that. Um, if uh, you look at the slide, you can see that these are our ambitions uh, for our zero emission transport. And uh, most of these ambitions are laid down in our national climate agreement that was concluded in 2019 after some uh, heavy discussions with lots of with over 100 stakeholders in society and government. 
So also in our current uh, government coalition uh, agreement, it is stated that by 2030, we want all new sales of passenger cars to be zero emission by the tail, that is. So it's uh, either battery electric or fuel cell electric. By 2030, also all public transport needs to be zero emission. And even in 2025 already, all new buses should be zero emission. And at the moment, we're already at 25% of our fleet of public transport buses. That is uh, zero emission already. By 2030, also, we want to have zero emission city logistics. And uh, by 2025, um, already the 30 to 40 largest municipalities have said that they will have zero emission zones for um, commercial vehicles. So that really helps to get more uh, manufacturers to produce them, but also to have some uh, for charging infrastructure. And another thing is that also the dedicated transport. So you can see in the top the picture. So it's for school buses or for uh, buses for uh, people who have a disability. Uh, it has to be zero emission as well uh, by 2025. So these are all the ambitions of the Dutch government that we're working towards. And the next one, please. So this is all in vehicles or zero emission zones and to make sure that our charging infrastructure is uh, will keep up with that. We have a national charging infrastructure agenda, which has been drawn up with all the relevant stakeholders. And the motto of this uh, agenda is that charging your electric car should be as easy as charging your phone. And uh, what is interesting is that this is a very complete approach. So it handles uh, regular charging, but also fast charging. It's about private chargers at home or at work. It's about public chargers, about semi-public chargers. It's hand in hand with the energy transition. So that means we'll try to make maximum use of the car battery as a, in the energy transition to, uh, for example, uh, give back energy to the grid or um, make sure that it has a stabilization uh, of the grid function. And we are working towards a mature market. Uh, in this agenda, we have the Netherlands divided into six regions. So five regions and the four biggest cities are also one region. Uh, it's supporting municipalities because all these regions have a, like an, uh, a, back, a back office that helps municipalities with uh, their tenders and uh, information on uh, how you do with chargers. We collaborate very active with the grid operators because of course it's very important to have a very early cooperation and collaboration with the grid operators because they need to make sure that the grid is ready for this. And under this agenda, there are several working groups uh, addressing specific points, such as uh, logistics, which is our next challenge, I think, but I think we'll talk about that later. Uh, safety, uh, which is car safety, but also cybersecurity issues, for example. And smart charging, also very important to tackle the energy transition. And then uh, I have one more slide, I think, uh, to show you, which gives you a kind of summary on our approach to electric mobility. And um, I think, well, of course, government leadership, as you asked, uh, Mutia, I think that's indeed one of, the, um, one of the reasons behind it. We've had strong ambitions from the government side and since 2011 already, so more than 10 years now, we have action plans uh, for mobility. We started with some niches. So lease cars were the first to act and buses for public transport because there the government has some influence by incentives or by uh, tendering uh, procedures. So people start uh, getting uh, uh, used to electric cars and then you can slowly uh, expand. Uh, fiscal incentives are of course important to stimulate the uptake of electric vehicles. And I think the thing about the Netherlands is that we, had, uh, we now have a battery electric focus. Uh, we used to have a more plug-in hybrid focus, but we have gradually shifted our measures to more favoring full electric vehicles as we want to reach zero emission uh, targets. And then of course, uh, a great attention to charging infrastructure from the start with uh, a great deal of local and regional participation. As in the Netherlands, it's the municipalities who yeah. put down uh, the chargers, uh, most of it. And one important thing I think is that from the start already, we've had interoperability which means that by one charging pass, you can charge everywhere on every charger. So for EV drivers, there's no hassle in having to carry 
uh, like 10 different passes. Um, so you can charge everywhere and it's all arranged in the back office. Uh, so very easy. Uh, luckily, also the companies in the Netherlands, they saw this from the start because by having interoperability and open protocols uh, for everyone, the market is bigger and it's easier for everyone to enter, but still you will have the same conditions and uh, how to say base uh, grounds uh, for everyone. And one other, uh, how do you say, milestone is uh, we believe a lot in public-private cooperation. We have an, uh, a public-private platform, which is called the Formula E-Team, or Holland E-Mobility in English, we call it. And it's uh, you, uh, all the, the stakeholders are united there. So the car importers, uh, the garages, uh, the energy people, the grid operators, uh, even some NGOs, uh, environmental NGOs or the consumer organizations. They are all united in this one platform. They advise the ministry of what they think is necessary. And they try to take away some blockers and stimulate e-mobility. So, uh, well, in a, a, a very quick summary, I think uh, these are our key elements to uh, electric mobility that have worked for us at least. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing, uh, Sonia. I really like it uh, when you say it, you want to make, you know, charging the electric car as easy as charging your phone. And also that Dutch government thinks about the interoperability, right? The harmonization for all the systems, standardization, because it's easier. It makes it easier for for new uh, yeah, players to come, right? You don't have to... Yes keep standardizing or using different tools to, to make it work. So let me first uh, give the um, stage to the industry player, EV Box, right? The ambition, making it as easy as charging your phone. As, as, as the rep, industry rep, uh, maybe you can start by giving a little bit of introduction uh, about EV Box. Uh, I would like to ask you, as the one who's really translating this policy into real work, um, how did the uh, the policy that uh, Sonia has explained so far has helped EV Box to grow its business. What is currently covered? I'm, I'm curious to know, and and what could be done better? Kun, uh, maybe you want to shed a light on, on this. Yes, thank you very much, and well, thanks again for for the invitation and uh, to be able to be part of this this important forum. Um, well, let me start by uh, introducing myself and, and our company. So I'm, uh, I'm Kuhn from, uh, from the EVbox group and I'm leading the policy affairs practice here from Brussels. Um, so uh, our group, and perhaps you can go to the first slide here. Uh, our group indeed is, uh, is 10 years old. Let me start with that. So uh, we have grown from the Netherlands, from Amsterdam since 2010. Um, along the way, along along the way with with the government government plans that that Sonia just uh, presented, uh, we have felt our, ourselves very comfortable in in the Dutch market. Um, but we have ex expanded since 2010. We have expanded globally. So today we have uh, charging equipment uh, installed across uh, the globe in more than 70 countries, uh, and we have offices in uh, in more than 13 countries worldwide. Um, what do we do is basically, um, well, we position ourselves around um, EV charging, um, hardware, software, and services. So we don't know, not only develop the EV charging equipment, so the stations itself from, uh, from slow to very fast, ultra fast chargers with a capacity of more than 350 kilowatt, uh, but we also make sure that these stations um, are interoperable that uh, they're connected to the right systems, that they can be managed by, uh, by fleet operators, by any entity basically that wants to somehow integrate uh, EV charging in, in their own uh, business model. Um, and next to that, well, we have uh, an extensive set of services that we, that we uh, bring on top of the heart and software. So uh, we have a quite a holistic approach when it comes to the rollout of uh, EV charging infrastructure. Um, as said, we have grown from the Netherlands and well, it is, and that's the next slide, it is, um, it is important to somehow, well, understand the global picture uh, because Sonia just highlighted um, the, let's say, the best practice and where the Netherlands stands in terms of the EV rollout. But I think that's, that's really an important starting point for us as a company. Basically, what we need is the cars. We need electric cars in order to, well, 
uh, provide our investors with uh, a long-term, um, well, long-term certainty. Um, we need to get visibility on what comes to the market in terms of model models, in terms of volumes. Um, and well, the Netherlands, as well as, uh, and, and that's where I take a more European perspective from Brussels, uh, Europe, the European Union has done uh, quite a bit in making sure that we get that visibility, that we get that certainty. Um, and I think the most important driver for us as a company so far um, has been indeed the European CO2 standards, uh, standards that have been set um, at, let's say, at group level, OEM level, um, CO2 standards that, let's say, the car makers need to comply with uh, along the way. So um, these are basically targets that have been set for specific dates for the next uh, for the next 10 years, uh, and they will eventually increasingly push electric models to come to the market. Um, so this has been basically also the most important driver um, that, that led us to the, the, the major achievement of, uh, of growth last year in, in Europe. Um, so um, Sonia presented this slide where we compared regions and, and indeed since last year, there was the first year where these standards kicked in. Well, there was no surprise that, well, we saw a lot of models uh, hitting the market. Um, and this is, let's say, where the Netherlands and other countries start to excel. If you can go to the next slide. So this is the starting point. Um, what, what we will see happening uh, in Europe, and that, let's say, that will be implement, implemented in all the other European countries as well, is that, well, these standards will be revised upwards. So there is European policy that will be implemented at the national level that will lead us to somehow see these standards, uh, the number of grams of CO2 per kilometer that can be emitted by the overall car fleet, these standards will go down and, gra and gradually, let's say, uh, lead to a full phase out of ICE vehicles. Um, and eventually this is what, uh, what provides us with, uh, well, the certainty that, that um, there will be um, products, there will be EV drivers that will need our charging equipment uh, along the way. So this is really the overall framework that helps us getting clarity on, on how the market will grow. And it's such an important driver uh, that have we seen so far and with, uh, with the ambition that we can expect from the European Commission and the heads of state in the next, uh, next two years, we, uh, we are sure that, that this market will continue to grow. But this is, let's say, the starting point. Um, if you can go to the next slide. In addition to, uh, well, setting these standards, um, the Netherlands, but also a range of other European countries, they uh, put in place uh, additional incentives. Uh, and also Sonia here again, she um, hinted at that. Incentives that push the uptake of immobility. So purchase incentives for those that, um, well, somehow when making the calculation did not see the TCO, the total cost of ownership make up compared to an ICE. Well, those incentives have until now have been contributed to, uh, to bring in the, the models. Um, Come to the come to the market and um, well it's not only the Netherlands there have been uh, quite a number of other countries that in in the last year I must say have introduced quite um, quite large uh, set of purchase incentives or tax reductions um, in addition to that well um, not only the Netherlands but there's uh, a number of other European countries Sweden Ireland uh, well Great Britain Denmark uh, France and soon also Belgium they have set particular phase out dates which again is a driver for bringing um, models to the road. So this is about the car. And again, I cannot stress enough that the car is the most important driver for us. The more EV models we somehow see hitting the market, the more we better can anticipate what the market for charging infrastructure then is. And well, also on that front, on the, the charging uh, equipment side, there has been uh, a set of incentives, policy incentives, um, direct subsidies, tax reductions that um, have helped to roll out and have helped um, citizens, companies to start investing in the infrastructure. Um, because in the end of the day, well, there has been this, this debate in the Netherlands and, and, and elsewhere in, in Europe about, well, what needs to come first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, because, well, you need to get the cars before companies start investing in the equipment. Uh, and one way or the other, with the fact that we have phase out dates, but we have CO2 standards that have killed the debate because there is reassurance that we get the models 
And with, let's say, the, the early incentives that have been put in place recently, we now also see much more companies, um, hosp um, well, retail change, uh, OEMs, utilities, uh, well, basically any business that somehow uh, wants, to, uh, wants to transform um, their fleet or wants to tra transform their parking lots and, and make it uh, suitable for, uh, for electric mobility, they have started investing in, in charging equipment. Um, and that brings me actually to the last point. Um, so what, what has gone well? I think all of this has been really um, somehow led to Europe and the Netherlands in particular take the lead. Uh, and that brings me to the last slide, is that the last slide that also Sonja showed what actually policymakers, governance authorities need to do or can do in order to further drive the uptake of EV infrastructure. Well, is, as I said, First, get the car incentives right and, and the car picture right. Second is indeed is making sure that, well, there is the right enabling policies put in place to, um, to drive the uptake of EV infrastructure. And it all starts with being visionary. And that's where the Netherlands honestly led. Uh, Sonia referred to the charging infrastructure plan that uh, the Netherlands, in cooperation with the regions, in cooperation with the cities, in cooperation with the industry and all other stakeholders developed and is still developing EV Box as a company. We are part of these working groups. We are advising the government on smart charging, on all the relevant aspects as to how to, let's say, make sure that the vision that they've spelled out in this plan is actually reached and is properly implemented. So it all starts by putting out a vision and somehow um, putting forward the target that you want to achieve on the basis of what you expect in terms of the volumes. So target oriented is, 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 is let's say the starting point of all of this. Uh, second is that indeed, once you have start, set out a vision and a target, you need to look at, okay, how can we help the market? How can we make sure that eventually there becomes a market business case for all of this? And that it's not uh, subject to public support only. So you need, you need to look at where does charging takes place? Charging takes place not only on the roads, most of the charging actually today takes place at homes, in apartment buildings, at retail locations. Um, so make sure that, let's say, once you start planning, look at all the different use cases and look at where electricity basically is provided and how you can tap into these electricity networks. Um, so look at the market, look at the use cases, understand where EV charging happens. Um, and that's, let's say, that, that will drive eventually then investment. Third element is that, well, it needs to be future-proof. So um, future-proof means let's make sure that you, uh, that you once you start planning and mapping up exact locations where to install uh, chargers, that they also match with the energy system needs. So look at where energy, um, well, capacity bottlenecks occur or where grid upgrades need to be, need to be uh, tackled or where grid extensions need to be foreseen in order to, prov to provide for the needs of all the different types of vehicles. Uh, that eventually need to become electric. And that's indeed the point that I highlighted here as well. One thing is indeed to look at passenger cars, like the Netherlands uh, has done. You need to look at all types of vehicles along the way, because eventually it's not just the, the, the passenger, car, passenger cars only. Uh, well, it's vans, it's commercial cars, it's, um, it's trucks uh, eventually as well. And, and you need to start planning now in order to serve the needs of those vehicles in 10, 15 years from now. And the last point, uh, and I know I'm running out of time, is indeed, uh, in the end of the day, this market stands or falls with being able to uh, look at the, the driver needs eventually. You need to understand uh, what are the basic needs that a driver has. And it all starts with, well, making sure that you embed interoperability in your, uh, in your policies. So this, uh, this relates to making sure that hardware is compatible and is standardized as possible. So in Europe, we have a standardized plug with which we work very straightforward set at the European level across the board. It's, it's, it's straightforward for uh, the producers. It's straightforward for the end users. The same for payment, the same for pricing. Make sure that it becomes clear um, across the board what kind of technical requirements are set on all these aspects. Roaming is a topic that actually is very uh, relevant for, let's say, uh, well, drivers that, that use cards and want to get connected to as many networks as possible, very relevant in, let's say, a fragmented market today like Europe, where that is still not, not possible, but it's something that, that you want to see that with one subscription, you can actually get to many, many different networks at the same time. And last but not least, in the end of the day, this is a business, and I cannot stress this enough, a business of cooperation, a, a business where um, hardware manufacturers need to work with operators, need to work with grid uh, utility providers. We need to work with city authorities. In the end of the day, 
you need to somehow um, have an open data model in place. And this is also what the Netherlands supported. Put in place open an open market structure around data so that data can also be shared, obviously uh, with the right protection for consumers and with the right data sen sensitivity protections for companies. But uh, this will enable, let's say, the, the best, the best um, well, data-driven deployment eventually as well across, across the territory. So these are, let's say, some, some, some pieces of advice uh, for uh, how to put in place the best policy practices. And I'm happy to, to uh, let's say, answer any questions you have. Thank, Thank you. you, Kun. Very, very clear, very comprehensive. I think the, the one view I see from the industry player is that having a certainty about the demand is really important, right? So now seems like the Netherlands have done great in uh, making sure that the incentives are there, but there are so many things that can be improved among many. The visionary part, it is already there, but can be improved more market-oriented, future-proof, or maybe we're actually already there in the Netherlands, Could, uh, but then we can be more better and also uh, uh, dr uh, dr dr driver friendly. Thank you very much, Kun, and also Sonia for the first part, for the first half of the story from the Netherlands. I, I, I got a very complete picture from you. And I think now I would like to see from uh, the emerging markets such as Indonesia. So let's see how the EV charging landscape look like. And I would like to ask Ibu Ida, uh, could you please uh, shed some lights on where we are? now and where are we heading in terms of vision, ambition, planning, outlook, et cetera. Please, Ibu Ida. Yeah, thank you, Otia. Uh, okay, uh, in this occasion, I would like to uh, present about the policy of Indonesia electricity sector and the development of EV uh, charging station infrastructure in Indonesia. Next, please. Uh, to encourage the implementation of the national energy policy to achieve national energy security and education based on clean and sustainable energy, the government have developed several strategies known as the Grand National Energy Strategy. This strategy is uh, prepared uh, to face energy challenges in the future, namely energy demand uh, that continues to increase while energy supply is limited. One of the strategy is uh, Grand Strategy of National Energy is to increase the use of electric vehicle as an effort to reduce the dependence on fuel and to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Next, please. Uh, if we talk further about the EV development strategy, the government of Indonesia targets the utilization of EV by 2030, which is uh, as many as uh, 2 million electric cars and 13 million electric uh, motorcycles. With the increase in EV uh, utilization, uh, a positive impact uh, both from the government side, uh, reducing fuel import, saving energy, reducing greenhouse gas emission, increasing electricity consumption and uh, reducing fuel subsidies. And uh, from the community side, uh, saving expenses for vehicle operation will be achieved. Next, please. Uh, the government also plan to encourage uh, the usage of electric vehicle by issuing uh, MEMR regulation number 13 of uh, 2020 on the provision of electricity charging infrastructure for battery-based electric motor vehicle. We call uh, KPLBP as a follow-up to the presidential decree number uh, 55 uh, year 2019. This regulation uh, regulated the, the, the aspects, uh, business scheme, licensing procedures, tariff, incentive, and electricity safety regarding EV uh, charging infrastructure. Next, please. 
on December 17, uh, 2020, the Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources had conducted a public uh, launching of the EV program to map the commitment from minister agencies, regional uh, government, state-owned companies, and private sector in the utilization of EV, uh, as shown in this slide. Next, please. The Directorate General of Land Transportation, uh, Ministry of Transportation, had compiled a roadmap uh, on the requirement of a government operational EV uh, for 2021 to uh, 2030, uh, as shown in this uh, slide. Next, please. Uh, PT PN Persero uh, has compiled uh, both uh, roadmap for electric vehicle and roadmap for EV charging infrastructure. Uh, as of July 2021, there are 166 uh, EV charging uh, station unit installed in uh, 135 uh, locations. Three units in Sumatra, 15 units in Banten, uh, 75 units in Jakarta, 26 units in West Java, 30 units in uh, Central Java and uh, Yogyakarta, uh, 70, 27 units in East Java and Bali, and uh, three units in Sulawesi. As I saw you before, uh, Ministry of uh, Mineral Energy and Mineral Resources had uh, published uh, minister, uh, MEM regulation number 13 uh, of 2020. Three main aspects are regulated, uh, namely standard and safety, electricity stipulation, and electricity tariff uh, for EV charger station and EV uh, Battery swap station. If we compare EV fast charging tariff data from several countries, it turned out the fast charging tariff in Indonesia uh, around uh, 2,466 rupiah per kilowatt hour is competitive compared uh, to other countries uh, that have been developing EV for a long time. Uh, the average uh, fast charging rate uh, is around uh, 5,000 rupiah per kilowatt hour. The MEMR re uh, regulation number 13 uh, of 2020 also regulates uh, the business scheme of uh, EV charger station. Although for the first time, the provision of EV charter station is carried out through an assignment to PTP and Persero, private sector are also encouraged uh, to provide EV charter station infrastructure. PLN and existing business area holders can directly sell electricity through EV charter station, while any interested uh, business entity must apply for business area stipulation with EV charter station located on at least uh, two provinces and public use electricity provision uh, business license. EV charging infrastructure uh, consists of EV battery swap station and EV charging stations. Licensing requirement uh, for battery swap station are business re registration number and uh, ratification of the establishment of a business entity. For EV charging station, the required licensing requirement are the integrated electricity provision business license for uh, public use and the electricity provision business license for uh, public use sale. We expect uh, that uh, by 2030, uh, there are uh, around 30, 
Setia One Thousand uh, Charging Station uh, we call SPKLU in several locations across Jakarta, Bandung, Tangerang, Semarang, Surabaya, and Bali. While the number of uh, battery substation uh, we call SPKLU for two wheel electric vehicle will be uh, 67,000 units uh, by 2030. To encourage the development of uh, the EV ecosystem, the government uh, provides incentive in the term of reduced install installation costs, uh, reduced electricity subscription uh, guarantees, and exemption from minimum account for the first two years. The government also uh, provides incentive uh, through PLN on EV charging rates uh, by giving discount uh, from uh, 10 p.m. to 5 p.m. Because at the time, the reserve margin of the Jawa Bali system is relatively high. For battery substation, uh, currently there are uh, 70 for uh, battery substation installed in uh, 73 location in uh, Jakarta, Banten, and uh, West Java. There are two battery swap location on the Directorate General of Electricity. The government has uh, formulated uh, various policies to encourage uh, the development of the EV ecosystem in Indonesia which of course uh, require support from various parties. Uh, That's what I can share uh, on this happy occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibu Ida, um, for, the uh, for the presentation. It's also quite interesting for us, uh, all of us here to know uh, there is um, you know, another nuance of EV charging because in, in Europe, you only see EV charging for a car and, you know, public transport. But in Indonesia, it seems like there is more elaboration to that, also for two-wheelers and also uh, battery swap, right? And we see Indonesia also has a huge ambition because now we have around 572 EV charging station, which, uh, and then we hope to, uh, to be able to, uh, to grow it to 30, 31,000 for EV charging station and 67,000 to ba battery swap station. So the same ambition, different kind of policies. Uh, and I would like to ask uh, our uh, speakers, uh, Sonia and Kuhn from the Netherlands, right? If you see from Ibu Ida's presentation, what do you think about the market? Um, and do you have you know any comments for example for the exist from the existing policies is there any things that could be done so that we can achieve the ambitions to have 31,000 EV charging station and 67,000 of battery swap station by 2030 or maybe kun uh, you can start well yeah first of all i think it was very interesting uh, to see that there is indeed some uh, some trajectory outlined and that you somehow know what you can anticipate uh, or at least what you expect to anticipate um, but as we all know somehow technology goes so fast these days that well very likely these numbers will need to be revised al along the way um, but i think most most important uh, from this presentation is is let's say the next step the implementation phase as to well um how do you, let's say, see um, the, the need um, for those expected vehicles? Where will they be um, driving? Where will they be um, likely to be bought? Uh, in which regions? Um, at which locations? What kind of, let's say, uh, traffic patterns will they have? So I think that's that's the next step that we've seen also in Europe, um, loc loc location strategies uh, eventually. Um, that, that need to be fined. Um, and then the second question is, in, is indeed, how do you somehow, um, which is the question I had for the presentation, how do you somehow can go to businesses? So what will you do for businesses to somehow start adopting e-mobility in their mindset? So uh, how can uh, they be persuaded and can they be incentivized to start investing in e-mobility in e infrastructure to provide also the charging equipment 
uh, for uh, for the electric models that will will come to the road. Um, so I think it's good that there's an objective, there's a target, there's expectations. The next step is indeed what are the implementation some somehow plans at at regional local level uh, according to the exact needs of of those different drivers. Thank you, Kun. Sonia. Yes, thank you, Mutia, and thank you, uh, Ibuida, for your very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. I, it's great to hear that in, Indonesia has such a, a nice um, targets as well, as Kuhn was explaining as well. And I especially liked that uh, the government is acting as a launching customer uh, because, uh, well, as I stated in the in our movie, transition starts with ambition, so the government can be a very uh, well uh, launching customer. And also that helps Kuhn for the businesses because then you can make sure that the chargers for all these government fleets are put in place because that's kind of that's a thing you can control. So that might be a first step to uh, also entice the market and industry players to, uh, to enter. And um, also what I liked that is, I think I concluded you have smart charging incentives already in Indonesia, which is of course, if you want to look at the, I hear an echo, I'm not sure if you're hearing it as well, but um, well, I hope you can still understand me. So smart charging, I think it's quite important also to look at the future and maybe also give some, it's also in the business model for companies. So it might help them if you uh, look at that. And another thing that I, wrote down, but that Kuhn mentioned already, I think, but I'll stress it once more, is that if you look at the implementation uh, side, um, in the Netherlands and European countries, we are more and more municipalities are looking to data-driven choices for installation, uh, location of installation of chargers. So that really helps because then you choose the right location for businesses to make money. Because in the end, there has to be made money in this system, otherwise it won't work. So I think um, that's one thing that I could add from our Dutch perspective. Thank you very much, Sonia. Ibu Ida, any comments on uh, the feedback, the, the comments from Sonia and Kuhn? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mutia, uh, with Sonia and Pak Kuhn. As I mentioned before, that uh, Indonesia have a huge uh, target to develop uh, EV. Uh, but uh, as you know, until now, we have uh, many challenges uh, to develop uh, EV, uh, like uh, the battery, maybe, and the battery, and then uh, how to uh, accelerate the if we charging station and then uh, right now uh, the pricing of the uh, if we is uh, still expensive and then uh, how to the uh, the pricing uh, to go down uh, and this is opportunity uh, to uh, investor yeah, to come in Indonesia uh, to invest uh, in uh, EFI. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Ida. Thanks. Uh, so I think we've heard both from uh, the Netherlands side and the Indonesian side that, um, yeah, the importance of EV, what kind of policies we can use to simulate. Both of the, the countries have planned to be there, although different nuances. And I think uh, to be able to hear from two perspectives, for sure, is very helpful uh, for, for both of us. Uh, now, before our break, we will have 10 minutes break, but before that, we would like to uh, open the Q&A session. We have uh, Q, uh, some questions. Uh, this is addressed to either Sonia or Kuhn. So the, the question is, how is the trend for home charging and public charging activities in the Netherlands? Is it be better to boost and prepare the grid to support home charging or provide an interconnected public charging? So uh, I don't know who wants to start. Maybe it starts from you, Sonia? Yeah. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for the question. It's a really good question, I think because I think it's very important to look at the, the different landscape of every country or every region indeed. Because in the Netherlands, we believe charging is a mix 
of all possible of all the elements. A home in the Netherlands for people who have their own driveway, home charging is the most efficient. It's the cheapest and it's the most efficient way uh, because you can, I mean, you can leave it there overnight, uh, for example. You can also make use of smart charging uh, by that. But then some people, two thirds of people in Netherlands do not have their own driveway. So we need public chargers as well for uh, those people to be able to charge their electric vehicles. So, uh, but then uh, people might charge their vehicle at work also. So that's also considered private charging, I think. So you really need to develop a mix. And in the Netherlands, we see fast charging, of course, is important as well. But it's a kind of um, um, last um, because it's it's more expensive, as you saw on the graph as well that uh, Ibu Ida showed. Uh, but it's a market rate. Uh, in the Netherlands, we do not control the tariffs from the government. It's just the uh, uh, market rates. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think it's, um, well, yeah, well, maybe that's my first, but my school doesn't have any time anymore, so. <laughs> Please. Well, I'm happy to react, but honestly, my internet connection just uh, was unstable. So if you could quickly repeat the question. Um, yeah, no worries. That would be great. So how is the trend for home charging and public charging activities in the Netherlands? Is it better to boost and prepare the grid to support home charging or provide an interconnected public charging? Okay. Um, well, how, how do we see, let's say, the landscape today? Um, so for the Netherlands in particular, I think Sonia just just uh, made the point that um, those who have invested, I would say, in electric mobility until today have been most of the times people that have their own driveway. Um, because, well, most of, let's say, these vehicles uh, were not reaching TCO levels compared to IC vehicles, so they were indeed more expensive uh, eventually. So uh, you get, let's say, a part of the population, which is, let's say, uh, capable of investing in these vehicles, they have done so, and typically they had uh, the possibility to charge at, at home. Um, and well, eventually, if you look at the total volume of electricity as such, there is not, not really an issue. It's not about the volume. It's not about, let's say, how much electricity is needed. It's really, uh, well, related to local capacity uh, issues, if we would talk about um, capacity issues. And it's not um, easy to say, well, this is 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 something that is happening everywhere. No, it can depend from street to street. It can depend from city to city. Um, so home charging indeed is in the Netherlands, but also elsewhere in Europe, the most um, well uh, used use case, uh, the most promising use case. So uh, if you look at the numbers, it's around, let's say, in average in, in Europe, and uh, the Netherlands is a bit below that, it's 60%, uh, with an additional 20% uh, happening at workplace or, um, well, destination charging, so supermarkets, restaurants, uh, and, and others. And there's, let's say, um, a 10, 15% happening in the public domain. We will, with, let's say, the increasing uptake of electromobility, with also, let's say, people who don't not necessarily have a, a driveway, living in apartment buildings, uh, or living in a street where there is no driveway, we will also see um, these people starting investing in, in EVs, once the TCO levels reach uh, reach parity and go below, eventually we will also see them investing, and then we will see the public share going up till well 30, 35, 40 percent on average in in the in the Netherlands. Um, again, it depends from city to city, from region to region. So um, so and that applies, I think, across across the across the EU. So it's 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 not a question of volume. It's not a question of not enough electricity. It's a question of local local um, bottlenecks. So if you want to deploy, for example, ultra fast charging stations uh, next to a highway or at a supermarket, um, then exactly you need to look at at the grid capacity uh, possibilities there, and if need be, um, upgrade them at additional capacity. Um, so yeah. I think it, it it depends from location to location, honestly. Okay, so it depends. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so just to one, add one more thing. Maybe also we are developing more and more smart charging plazas, okay. which also um, gives gives less stress on the grid, but then you can still use lots of chargers on this uh, grid uh, capacity. So that's also maybe a solution for that. Okay. Thank you. And we still have one uh, time for one more question, uh, also to Sonia and Kuhn. 
Uh, and also, please feel free, uh, Ida, if you want to add more uh, to that. The question is, is there any rule of thumb about the ratio between EV and EVCS, EV charging station, to make it profitable to the EV charging station owner and acceptable to the customers? Few Q, a few Q lists at the same time. Yeah, well, in, in Europe, we have a European directive. It's called the Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Directive, mm -hmm. which uh, prescribes uh, but it's still being under, it's being, um, how do you say, renegotiated now, but at least it describes one charger per 10 parking places for buildings. So you have a ratio of one out of 10, that is. Uh, so that's a kind of uh, thumb, rule of thumb from Brussels that is mm -hmm. prescribed for European countries. Um, okay. Well, actually, that rule is indeed being being revised the next week. Yes, and it needs to be revised, but... <laughs> And uh, well, um, very interesting enough, the commission is gonna, um, let's say, change that uh, and no longer gonna work with numbers, but gonna work with capacities. So very likely we're gonna end up with a specific minimum threshold in terms of capacity that needs to be deployed per vehicle, per car, passenger, per truck. And well, what we've seen in, let's say, an EV box, uh, when we talk about public, publicly accessible charging stations, so supermarkets, highways, you name it. Well, it's it's a minimum of three kilowatts that you need per vehicle to be deployed. Um, so that's a rule of thumb between three and five kilowatts. Three uh, to five kilowatt. okay. In terms of installed capacity, you need per vehicle. Uh, when we talk about trucks, this goes this goes way, way above that. Um, okay, so this is for a personal vehicle. Okay, and one more question. I think, uh, yeah, it's also to Sonia and Kuhn, based on your experience, is it better to have the charging station to be state owned or an open business scheme? Well, <laughs> very perfect question because you're from the business and you're uh, yeah, from, from the government. Uh, what would you say? Open market model is what we stand for, what we promote. Um, in the end of the day, it's, it's that's, that's where competition can, can work. It's that's where um, the best possible service at the best, let's say quality uh, at the best possible rates will be offered eventually. If you allow different businesses to uh, to offer charging services, um, EV drivers eventually will find out where uh, the best operator will be, where the best mobility service provider will be uh, placed, and and will sign up at those. So uh, if you leave it to the market, for sure you will get uh, the best possible outcome. That's at least how we experience that here in in the Netherlands and in Europe. Yeah. Yes, I to totally agree. I, it, for consumers, for industry, for government, for innovation open market model is the best answer for all of those issues, I think. Okay. Maybe a little bit of uh, um, comments from Ibu Ida. Ibu, Ida. Ibu Ida, do you agree that, uh, because in the Netherlands, they say that open business scheme, scheme is, the, is, is better than state-owned, but how about us in, in Indonesia? Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I add some information about the uh, home charging, yeah? Home charging is uh, as important as uh, public charging and uh, therefore government provide tariff incentive for home charging, including incentive uh, to upgrade the home installation uh, to support EV charging. As I have shown in my slide, uh, then between uh, 10 p.m. and uh, 5 p.m. the following day, uh, the owner of EV uh, charging is encouraged uh, to charge uh, their vehicle at a uh, 30% uh, discount. For the public charging, uh, we focus on medium uh, to fast charging in building. And then uh, for uh, public charging, uh, one charger for uh, it's uh, 20 kilometer, uh, but that is uh, still rule of thumb. But more importantly, actually uh, to provide uh, charging infrastructure in many public places, especially in the office building and supermarket. And uh, we, we have a uh, president regulation a number uh, 55 uh, year 2019, uh, we provide a uh, first assignment uh, to PTPL and Persero to, uh, to put uh, EV uh, charging station. 
but also open uh, for other state owned uh, company uh, like Pertamina as well as uh, private company uh, in, uh, including cell. Uh, this uh, business scheme uh, has been regulated in uh, Ministry of uh, Energy and Mineral Resources uh, number 13, year 2020, uh, that provide detailed business uh, model uh, for state and private uh, sector. This is uh, all that I can add. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. For, for the additions. So thank you, Kun, for joining us. Uh, uh, the other person, another person from EV Box will join us for a second session. In the meantime, please enjoy uh, 10 minutes of break. Please enjoy, grab a cup of coffee, enjoy your tea. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you all. See you in 10 minutes. Thank you.
welcome back everybody. I hope you enjoyed your short break. Uh, I had a nice uh, uh, tea, so it was good for me. I hope you had a nice break too. Uh, we're ready to go to the session two. In session two, we would like to learn more about the blockers because in the first session, we learned more about enablers as well as in the second session, we would like to know whether Indonesia is actually an attractive market uh, from the lens of industry players such as EVbox. Uh, in relation to that, I would like to introduce our new speaker. So Kun is uh, now will be um, replaced by Carlos. So Carlos uh, Borales Rosso has worked in various commercial roles prior to joining EVbox. He is currently the regional director of New Markets, and as the title says, he is responsible for bringing smart and scalable charging solutions to emerging market worldwide. The discussion with him today will give us some views on whether Indonesia is an attractive market from the lens of an international industry players. Uh, Carlos holds an engineering degree from the National University of Colombia and an MBA from the University of Cambridge. Please welcome, Carlos. Thank you, Mutia. It's a, it's a pleasure and I'm delighted to be here uh, sharing these views today. Yeah, likewise. So uh, I think uh, let's kick start for, for the session two. Uh, let's discuss more uh, about uh, the blockers. So following our discussion in the session one, uh, I think we all agree that policy incentive plays a huge role here, both not only for the EV charging itself, but also the EV cars, right? Because EV charging won't exist if EV cars not there and the other way around. Um, now let's talk about the blockers. I would like to ask Sonia, as the rep uh, from from the uh, from the RVO, uh, what are the blockers so far? You've been ten years uh, in, in EV mobility in e mobility. So what are the blockers um, for EV charging penetration in the Netherlands, and how did you overcome it? Yes, thank you, Mitya. Well, of course, there's still a lot of challenges that we need to overcome as well. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think you saw in the presentation from myself and from Kuhn that we have the densest charging network in the world at this moment. But still, if we want to reach our goals by 2030, we still have a lot of challenges to overcome. And the first of it is speed, because we need hundreds of installations per day if we want to reach our goals for 2030. So um, how do you get all the parties to uh, connect to the right speed? So how do you align all these different parties? And then we have a blocker in the fact that we do not have enough human capacity. We don't have enough uh, electro, electro technicians or inst uh, people working in, in, in the installation business. So we need to work on that to make sure that more people are uh, educated in that way. So it will be a huge market, but we, have, uh, a, a degree, we don't have enough of those uh, people. And another thing that's also, I think, which has been blocking uh, a lot, it's getting better now, but it's the business case. Because like I mentioned before, uh, it has to be made, I mean, money has to be made in this system, otherwise it won't go on, it won't be uh, sustainable uh, for the future. And in the Netherlands, uh, we have some regions already where companies actually pay to put down uh, in tenders, to put down chargers there in these regions. But we also, because they expect to make profits in the future, but we also have regions where, which are less populated where it's still not the case. So the business case has been and still is a huge uh, challenge or a blocker, but I prefer to say challenge because then it's something to overcome. And a blocker sounds like it stops there, so I, prefer to think in uh, challenges that can be overcome. And we are researching this at the moment to see how we can help to make the business model uh, suitable for the next years until the market can really sustain itself. And another thing I think is roaming across borders because, well, maybe it's not the case in Indonesia because that's a huge country, of course, but the Netherlands is only a very small country and we have handled roaming in the Netherlands. It's very easy, but People do not tend to stay in our country, especially with now the summer approaching. At least if pandemic rules allow us, uh, we hope to go abroad for our summer vacation. And then people with electric cars need to roam also across our borders. It's still a huge challenge that you can only overcome by collaborating with other countries. And of course, it helps a lot if uh, Brussels, the European Commission, lays down rules 
for this uh, for countries. Um, another thing I would say that at the moment, uh, because the next challenge is logistics, we need to electrify medium and heavy duty, also light duty vans, and um, more models need to come on the market. And I think it helps if governments have huge ambitions, because that will show industry players that there's really there's a need for more different types of electric vehicles also for medium and heavy duty because that's really our next big challenge to overcome because otherwise we also won't reach our climate goals uh, or global climate goals i think we also need to electrify or decarbonize at least um, the freight uh, sector um, and then maybe one last thing is that make sure the incentives that you have also fit your policy ambitions because we struggled in the Netherlands with we had a lot of ambitions for plug-in hybrid cars but in the end we had a lot of them and there was some also societal debate of people not using their car as an electric car but only as a, a fuel car as an ICE because of course you can do that with a plug-in hybrid and then they got incentives anyway so that's i mean and that gives um it's not good in uh, societal debate so you need to make sure that the incentives that you put in place also fit the, your overall ambitions because we had to shift and i don't know if you remember the first graph i showed the diagram of our ev uptake you can see we had some spikes yep. that's changing incentives that's just only only the effect of fiscal incentives being reduced or increased and then usually increased or decreased i mean so people buy them just before the end of the year because next year there'll be less incentives so you get a huge sales spike and then after a dip so that's not i mean I, from the government side i'm not supposed to say this maybe but it's not a good way of stimulating the market if you do it like that so do it differently yeah Wow, thank you very much. I see here, first, I think the mindset needs to be there. Don't see it as a blocker, right? But challenge to overcome. So it's already like a good blocking foundation before, you know, like going, achieving your ambition. And I also see some uh, technicalities, like you need more electricians to be able to, to, to do this. And also business case needs to be there. You also, the roaming uh, uh, across borders also needs to be solved. Logistics also, because you want to move more to the medium and here, uh, you want to reach medium and heavy duty um, vehicles. And most importantly, the incentive should fit, right? Because people can use the incentive for benefits that doesn't really, you know, relate to, to achieving the climate uh, ambitions, uh, the, the climate goals. So I think that's very well uh, put in there. Uh, Ibu, uh, just a, a short comments. Is there anything that we can learn from the Netherlands on how they plan or have uh, overcome uh, the, the blockers or the challenge uh, in implementing EV charging? Yeah, thank you, uh, Motia. Uh, the challenges uh, of development EV charging station and EV uh, battery swap station in Indonesia are uh, investment in EV charging station development is still relatively high. And then uh, electric vehicle uh, are currently categorized as luxury goods. And then uh, battery uh, prices uh, are still expensive. And uh, for the battery uh, prices, uh, we are in the process uh, to overcome this challenge, challenge uh, by streamlining battery production uh, from the domestic market. Indonesia has uh, the highest nickel reserve globally, and we are now developing industry to convert uh, the nickel into the raw material for lithium uh, ion battery. We have uh, engaged uh, with the partner from uh, international player uh, such as uh, LG Chem uh, from Korea and uh, CATL uh, from China. Those international uh, partners uh, are collaborating uh, with our state-owned battery holding uh, 
By doing so, we uh, we hope uh, to address uh, challenges uh, of battery prices, to make it price uh, competitive and uh, make Indonesia uh, one of key player of EV producer in the Southeast Asia region. And then uh, we need to have early uptaker uh, for EV as EV cars is still more expensive than uh, IC cars. And with limited uh, EV model, people tend uh, to choose conventional cars. Therefore, uh, it is important uh, to continuously educate the public. One event that we are doing uh, to conduct uh, EV public launching every year in December. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, if I see here, uh, it, it's different challenges, uh, but then the same things that we can learn is collaboration, right? To collaborate with a lot of parties here. Sorry, Sonia, do you want to add? Yeah, maybe something? I want to add because also I think like Ibu Ida mentioned, we also, uh, because many people do not buy a new car, but most people buy a second-hand car. And maybe that's the case in Indonesia as well. I, I hear Ibu Ida, right? Um, in the Netherlands as well, we need to develop the second-hand market, which also means something for battery guarantees and stuff like that. So that's also a challenge we're working on. We have a subsidy currently for second-hand cars, um, but it's only 2,000 euros. But still, it's a bit of an incentive, but it's also uh, a challenge for us still to develop the second-hand market. Thank you, Sonia, for uh, for 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 the uh, for the addition uh, to the discussion. So I think uh, it's really interesting, right, to know the differences between the market and how in Indonesia, for example, it's still considered as a luxury. But Sonia also said that is us actually not only in Indonesia but also in here they are also trying to develop secondhand EV car EV cars market. So we shared the burden here, the challenges here, and I hope to see more collaboration as well in the future. So talking about the two markets, we have. Carlos here. Uh, so let's hear more from him because EV Box play, uh, plans to expand the market to Asia. And I want to know from him, right? Uh, Carlos, could you please elaborate what's your plan going forward? And based on the discussion we had in the first session and just the discussion between Ibu Ida and Sonia, do you think Indonesia uh, is, is an attractive market for EV Box, so to say? And uh, why and why not? Yeah, definitely. Um, um, let me let me share a few slides just to uh, just to support support the uh, the, the the discussion. I, I hope you can see my slides now. Um, is that is that okay, Mutia? You can see my slides. Yes, I can see your slides. Excellent. Um, so. Going into your your first question, um, the, the the plans that we have for the region uh, are, are basically part of uh, a global global effort to um, to support the acquisition and, and adoption of, uh, of of electric vehicles and and, and the corresponding electrical vehicle uh, charging infrastructure. But uh, if if we if we look a bit at at, at this at this chart. So we'll be seeing that by you know by 2035 uh, or so, the there will be a parity in the in the share of annual sales uh, of, of new sales of vehicles, and so that means that we don't have a lot of time uh, until we see uh, a lot of electric vehicles on on the road. This is of course a, a, this are global numbers. Uh, however, the whole the whole uh, electric vehicle industry. Um, um, across the world will continue to grow at a very, very fast pace. So we need to realize this, and then we have to have, uh, like in previous discussions, all the incentives and players and stakeholders aligned uh, to support this vision. And, and of course, you know, um, uh, go after the, the main goal of decarbonizing transportation or electrifying transportation to reduce uh, emissions. And, and so what, what are we trying to do at, uh, at, at, at EV boxes? Um, we we have a strong ambition as well, same as uh, you know what 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 Sonia shared or what uh, Ibu Ida shared about the the ambitions of uh, um, this sector in Indonesia. We 
uh, we, we have decided that by 2023, we want to have around 1 million charging ports installed uh, across the world. We are now at standing, standing at 250,000. So that means uh, a lot of work. And you know, we've done all this work in about 10 years, as, as Kuhn mentioned before. And so this needs a very strong acceleration. And this is the, one of the main points. And so coming back to um, what kind of growth or what are our plans for, for the region, uh, we currently have uh, a presence in, in, in the region, in the Asia Pacific region, in Australia, New Zealand. And the way we work uh, in, in these areas where we don't uh, have a, a permanent presence is we build uh, a network of resellers and distributors that, uh, that, that are trained by us, that are um, um, supported constantly by us. And, and they are basically our people on the ground, right? And they are the ones who go into the market and, uh, and, and, and support the operations or activities around EV charging infrastructure. And so mainly we have seen uh, activity in Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, Singapore, India, and South Korea. And we started to see some things happening in Indonesia as well uh, through our partners. Uh, but but we, we see the, um, the large population of the country um, and the needs to, to, to decarbonize uh, transport as a great opportunity to be present in Indonesia. So clearly, uh, there's a case for us to be there. There's a case for us to, uh, to support uh, the, the goals of the Ministry of Energy and, and Mineral Resources. So we're, we're, we're happy to be in that position. Um, in terms of similarities, um, I, I'd like to draw a case of what we've seen in other places. Uh, we, in, in, in one of the regions I wanted to bring up here that I have data for and because we've conducted a study there, it's, uh, it's Latin America. Um, so we've seen that tax incentives, of course, uh, um, have proven to boost the speed of EV adoption. Um, and, and we can see, for example, places like, like Colombia in, in the middle, you see that the, the, there's the total tax for electric vehicles uh, compared to the total tax of internal combustion engine vehicles is, is quite different. And even though, like, like Ibu Ida uh, mentioned just recently, you know, the electric vehicle is perceived as a luxury good. Um, the, the uptake of electric vehicles in Colombia in the last two years has been, has been um, spectacular. The, the growth has been, has been great. And, and this, has, this has been heavily supported by the incentives on, on, the tax, uh, on the tax side. We've also seen, for example, the case of, uh, of Brazil where there's competition uh, and it's a similar case to, uh, to Indonesia, I believe, because um, in, in Brazil, there's, there's the biofuels and there's uh, also the compressed natural gas uh, presence that, uh, that creates competition with electric vehicles. And, and, and therefore, we haven't seen that strong adoption of electric vehicles, uh, despite the, the good tax incentives that they have put in place, at least in terms of uh, import tariffs. Um, so what this means is there has to be a framework of several things, not only incentives uh, in, in the tax form, but other types of uh, uh, um, um, aspects that support the, the growth. And so we, we've seen, for example, how creating engagement of other stakeholders um, has to do with also like purchasing incentives, um, you know, how, how the, 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 the initial price or cost of the vehicle is reduced. Um, also circulation incentives, you know, this, this, uh, this area of the world might be similar to Indonesia where we see a lot of traffic, uh, where it's, it's difficult to go from point A to point B at, at, a, at, at rush hour, um, and it's, it's a bit chaotic. And so circulation, it's, it's always, it's always a, a, an issue. And so giving incentives to those who use electric vehicles has, has been part of a uh, of, of that uh, uh, additional incentive for, for people to, to take on electric vehicles. And then other things that we have seen is uh, uh, a differentiated electric tariffs for those who, who own an electric vehicle, as in, you know, for charging. And, um, um, and, so the and also like the regulation for charging stations um, has been supporting the, uh, the uptake of, of, new, of new EV charging infrastructure. So, you know, through this we can see, for example, what kind of countries or what places are going and are moving in what directions and so this supports our our actual business case to go and pursue opportunities and in, in, in certain places. Um, 
and, and and finally, I wanted to like draw a bit on the uh, um, the, the the cases or, or the use cases that uh, that that Kuhn and and, and 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 Sonia were mentioning a bit in their in their uh, participations before, which is we see that uh, it's, it's mainly in the private uh, consumer and workplace uh, segments that uh, that we will see a strong growth. So here, this is this is for for um, AC charging stations, so what we call uh, a slow charging uh, equipment, and which is typically the one that we can see in a home uh, or or in a or in a mall or uh, a shopping center or or a corporate office. And when we see this, um, we're we're looking at about sixty percent of all devices. This is by twenty thirty and and in selected uh, markets, but uh, but it's a good sample of. Uh, how in certain markets um, we we see that very important uptake of private um, uh, private use and workplace, and so that means that we need to have the right capacities. And, and like Sonia mentioned, we, we need to have the, the capabilities and the human uh, the human element to to support this growth. So bearing in mind that um, there there is this challenge, it is important to see how across uh, the country. We, we, we set up the right incentives and the right uh, plans to, to support this. Um, and, and, and so talking about how, how we work and how we could, for example, potentially support the growth of, uh, of, of electric vehicle uh, adoption and in, in, in adoption of uh, electric vehicle charging stations, um, we see a set of capabilities that, um, that, um, that we haven't identified in in the in the companies we partner with, and so what what we will, for example, do in in Indonesia is look for companies that um, that are in certain sectors and and that have certain activities, so that we can collaborate with them in in you know training them in the use of electric vehicle, uh, sorry, in, in 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 charging infrastructure, training them around you know the different technologies that exist today, both in AC and DC. Uh, the different use cases, the different business models that are um, that that can be enabled locally, and so this will be part of our sort of contribution to 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 work locally with with companies there. And so, what sort of things are we looking at when uh, when when we think of like capabilities of local businesses? Um, one is the breadth of service, right? So, uh, um, how do we support them in 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 going into installation, into operations of the charging uh, stations, uh, maintenance? And, and actual management of those stations through uh, uh, through software. Um, what are the typical core businesses that uh, that these companies typically, uh, yeah, typically have, as they are themselves 100% in electric mobility, and this is their core business. But some of them are in the sort of electricity, energy, or utilities, or some of them might be in the security or monitoring systems, uh, and, and this is especially uh, targeted at residential use. Um, third is the financial stability. So we look, of course, for 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 companies that have a solid uh, um, a solid uh, uh, history and track record, so that you know they they can support their growth. And, uh, and and in terms of personal, this is a very important point. You know, we look at people uh, or companies that have uh, a strong sales team that can learn and is eager to learn about the, the electric mobility uh, segment and and go out in the market and support um, um, customers. And, and, and users alike, and 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 finally, you know, presence. Uh, we're looking for companies that are, that have a like a local, uh, well-established and national coverage, and 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 so this is uh, this this could be translated as what what are those criteria that we look at in certain markets so that they can really pick up and and grow and be competitive. So this this will be the sort of things that we'll be looking at uh, in, in in Indonesia, and um, yeah, so that's. Um, that, those will be my 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 initial points uh, here, Mitya. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, thank you very much, Carlos, for for your presentation uh, and for laying out the factors that will play a role whether uh, EVbox thinks Indonesia is an attractive market or not. I think it's very elaborate, and maybe I would like to hear before uh, we go to the uh, um, 
collaboration uh, session. Uh, Ibu Ida, what do you think about what Carlos is looking for uh, for a market? Do you think that makes sense or do you have any other idea? Uh, do you think Indonesia has all the list that he's looking for to invest? Uh, what would you say, Ibu Ida? Uh, thank you, Mutia. Uh... We are delighted uh, to see potential player uh, of EV charging infrastructure from the Netherlands. And then uh, we have open opportunity uh, to the private uh, sector to invest in public charging infrastructure. As I mentioned before, uh, uh, the various incentives uh, have been stipulated uh, in our Ministry of uh, MEMR regulation number 13, uh, year 2020. Uh, private sector uh, has the option uh, to add a cooperation uh, with the state-owned company, PTPLN, or establish uh, their own branding, such as uh, EV box. And the option is available. And then, uh, for license is very easy. Uh, it is uh, all managed by online single submission system, and uh, there is no cost uh, to get the license. Uh, please uh, feel free uh, to contact us uh, if you have interest uh, to invest in Indonesia if we charging a market. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Ida. So I think, yeah, that discussion maybe could happen after yeah. this if, uh, because it's a, it's a long discussion, right? To see whether Indonesia have all that six uh, factors that Carlos is looking for to invest. So I think I'll leave it up to you probably if uh, between Ibu Ida and Carlos later. So uh, let's first bring the discussion, let's uh, bring this discussion to the next level. Now, now that we understand more about the enablers, the blockers or the challenges, as well as the similarities and differences, I want to ask three of you, uh, do you see any opportunities for collaboration between us? What would be needed? Uh, what would be needed to help Indonesia to learn from the Netherlands as well as maybe there is a something else that Netherlands, for example, want to test because I believe uh, you also work uh, on e-mobility internationally, right, Sonia? And also for Carlos as an industry player. Uh, what, what could we do after, uh, as a collaboration uh, to make to bring this thing forward. Maybe I would like to hear first from uh, Carlos. Sure, sure. Um, it's 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 actually nice to bring these examples because um, um, we so we we work, we work globally and so we, we see the different situations and and and, um, and sort of yeah growth examples that have happened in different parts of the world um, and and I would summarize the opportunities for collaboration in, in, a few, in a few bullet points. So first is helping local companies understand the market and the local landscape. So it's, it's helping them understand how to do business in, electric, uh, in, 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 in the electric mobility world um, and how um, uh, actually to do business in, in, in uh, installing uh, AV charging infrastructure, which is uh, which is our business. Um, and it's and sometimes difficult to understand. The payback periods are long. The returns on investments are not that clear in the beginning. And so this requires some resilience. And so helping companies understand how resilient and how to look at those opportunities in the longer term, it's, uh, it's really important. So we try to advocate for that. Um, second, I would say is support the development of uh, capabilities in, in, in people. So through, through training and um, and, and, and technical assistance, we, we like to sort of bring those capabilities in, in local players. So that's part of the collaboration that we can uh, provide to, uh, to private and public parties alike. Um, finally, I think collaborating with the government in, in setting standards. And in, in, we've seen in, in places where there's a, there's, there isn't a, a, a selection of a standard for charging, but there's a confusion in terms of investment. So you, you, in, 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 in Europe, for example, you have a very clear defined standard for charging. So you have the, the plug that everyone uses is, is the same across Europe, um, but that's not the case in several uh, markets. And so 
setting those standards and supporting the government in, in, in defining those regulations for setting standards is important. Um, and, and yeah, I think my final point would be how, how we, you know, assisting in, in, in the acquisition of those skills for, for, uh, for, for, for people, right? Installing, operating, maintaining uh, EV charging stations. So those are the key areas where I see collaboration uh, with, with, with local entities. Yeah, thank you. How about you, Sonia? Uh, thank you, Mujia. Yes, uh, I agree to what uh, Carlos has said. Um, I think, um, well, especially if you look in the field of standards, it would be very, maybe a very nice opportunity to cooperate. Um, if we have the same um, uh, point, how do you say, the same um, starting points, maybe, then um, we could uh, try and make sure. Also, we are trying to see if we can have a standards discussion in UN um, bodies. So that, um, well, that might be maybe something to uh, cooperate on. And also, I think, um, as Carlos has mentioned, and of course, EVbox is one of our prime companies in this sector, and I think maybe the biggest and internationally most experienced, but we have others as well. So there's a lot of expertise in the Netherlands um, for uh, companies, and maybe it's also something that the Dutch embassy in Indonesia or the NBSO there could start something, a project on with EVbox, uh, or others to see and try how the Dutch and Indonesian companies can collaborate more together so they can uh, learn more in the field of the bullets that uh, Carlos described and that can help Indonesia develop a stronger EV market and uh, well reach their goals. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And how about, uh, how about you, Ibu? Uh, what kind of collaboration could we possibly do together? To bring this forward. Uh, okay, thank you, Mutia. Uh, some potential uh, area for collaboration uh, from government to government or business to business. Uh, Netherlands represent one set of EV charging infrastructure and can link the EV program to the national net zero emission. Uh, Indonesia is also uh, considering uh, to have. Uh, net zero emission uh, target, which currently uh, much more focusing on achieving uh, zero emission at the power plant, uh, power supply level, uh, based on uh, today's presentation from the Netherlands. I think that is a good idea to link EV program uh, with the net zero emission. Having said that, uh, we need to ensure that EV program is supplied from low carbon emission electricity and renewable energy, including uh, from the solar PV. Uh, we also uh, see that uh, it is important uh, to ensure uh, interoperability between different EV manufacturer and vehicle. Accordingly, we have mandated uh, to uh, utility three types uh, of plug uh, in socket, namely AC type two, CCS combo, and DC uh, charimo. This is uh, covered uh, under MEMR regula regulation number 13, uh, year 2020, regarding EV charging infrastructure. We also uh, learn about uh, the need uh, for close collaboration uh, with a uh, grid operator, PT PLN. We have uh, always involved grid operator in every aspect of EV policy information to ensure the support from grid operator, such uh, support include electric supply, Availability, safety requirement, and electric price uh, for the EV uh, supply. Regarding the close uh, collaboration uh, with the local government, uh, we also understand uh, that EV program need to have uh, support from the government at the provincial and district uh, city level. We have a uh, close coordination uh, and provide uh, support uh, for local government 
which have uh, explicitly uh, announced EV program such as uh, Jakarta, West Java, and Bali. We hope uh, that we can learn and cooperate with the Netherlands to address challenges uh, on those aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu. So we have challenges, we have enablers, but the best news is that we have plan here, right? So I hope this session will help us to collaborate together to bring EV charging to the next level, both in Indonesia and the Netherlands. Before I close uh, this session, uh, I would like to uh, open the Q&A uh, session. So we have a question already to all speakers. Uh, based on your experience, how do electricity utilities uh, play a role in developing EV charging penetration? Um, maybe Sonia, you want to answer first? You, the electricity so, utilities, so you mean the grid operators, right? Yeah, the grid operators, yeah, utility companies. Yes, they, they have a, yeah. an, a very important role, of course, because they handle the grid. So you need to, like I think also Ibu Ida was explaining uh, just before, you, you need to involve them uh, from the start also ahead, because especially if you're looking at greater um, uh, powers that have to be uh, larger powers, like for heavy duty or something, for logistics, that takes years to make such a large, to, to, uh, how do you say that in English? I'm not I'm looking for the word, to make the, the, to make the, the heavy connection, so the higher power uh, voltage, you need, to, you need years to, uh, to do that. So they need to start planning. And actually in the Netherlands, we have, um, the grid operators have uh, established a special knowledge and innovation center for electric vehicles. It's called ELAT uh, NL. And they are also doing outlooks to see how the projected uh, sales of uh, passenger cars, but also trucks, uh, and even they're looking at aircraft and uh, ships, how this, uh, if you re reach all these goals, if you look at the regions in the Netherlands, what does that mean if you look at the grid capacity, the local grid capacities? So they need to really plan ahead years to come. And well, I think they're crucial to involve. And Carlos, any? Uh... Yeah, and, yeah. In my, in my opinion, they. Yeah, I, I agree. They have a, they have a crucial role. Um, and and I and I'd like to look at this from two perspectives. One is for consumers, so for uh, for people in, in private homes, they supply electricity, and and so that means that if they jump into the business of uh, of yeah uh, installing uh, public charging infrastructure. Um, that means that there could be an easy connection of, you know, if you if you use a certain provider and you go and charge out in the streets, um, why not taking payments from your electricity bill, for example, right, and providing some certain uh, commercial advantages to doing this. So that that could be a possibility. It's it's something that I've seen in some emerging markets where it's difficult to set up like payment um, payment methods. Um, so when when we don't have yet the the whole alignment of uh, the payment providers, the banks, and, and et cetera, it's, it's a good way of uh, making it accessible for people to use uh, a public charging station, um, but then pay through your, um, through your utility bill. So that's one. And, and the second, it's on the, um, on, the, on the private sector. So of course, utility supply or have agreements of, of, uh, of, of power supply with large corporates. And so large, large corporates would have the ability to negotiate uh, special tariffs. And, and, and even uh, when they look at their own operations, when they, when they could electrify their own, their own operations. And so here, talk, here we're talking about fast moving consumer goods companies. We're looking at last mile delivery companies. So companies that have big fleets and, and that could have a very strong opportunity to electrify their fleets and not only uh, um, you know, making it possible, but, but they also have um, a, a justification from a total cost of ownership uh, point, point of view, right? So for them, it's, it's actually a very low uh, hanging fruit for, for these companies because they can switch their fleets today. They, they naturally have to switch their fleets every certain time. And so they could switch their fleets today, use electric vehicles instead. And so they would see a reduction in, in maintenance cost and operation cost um, and, and they can collaborate with the utilities 
to supply that electricity that they need. And even the utilities can some, some, sometimes act as, uh, as operators of the infrastructure. So we've seen um, several ag agreements and arrangements like this in emerging markets where, where this has supported these initial investments by large corporates. And, and, and it's actually how we can see uh, electric garbage trucks in the streets, uh, uh, light and heavy vehicles going out in the streets because uh, they're supported. Uh, it's not the, the, their, their own investment, but they're supported by, uh, by uh, utilities and, and other stakeholders. So um, uh, definitely a crucial role and they can support a lot. Thank you, Carlos. And we did that to close the, how important is the role of utility. So in here, I think PLN yeah, as the electricity provider in the success of EV charging and EV cars. Okay, thank you, Mutia. Uh, grid operator uh, has very important roles, as I have explained before. Uh, first, it is about uh, power availability for EV, and secondly, about price to the EV company. And in Indonesia, uh, PT PLN, the state of company, state owned company, uh, has uh, given the first assignment to develop EV charging infrastructure. And our regulation also open and encourage a collaboration between the state electric uh, company and private sector for EV charging infrastructure uh, development and operation. Uh, one of business model is uh, through provided uh, owner private operated. Uh, there are many other options. Uh, please uh, download the ministry regulation uh, number 13 year 2020 uh, for more detail. Thank you. We, we can't hear you, uh, Mutia. Sorry, I think I'm, I am myself uh, again. So thank you very much, Ibu, Ida, Sonia, and Carlos for for all the uh, the answers to the questions. And I think with that, I would like to conclude this uh, sessions. And uh, first of all, I think we learned that we have similarities, we have differences. And from here, you also see different playing field. Netherlands has started since 10 years ago. That's why it is become a country. It is today in terms of EV cars and EV charging, but that is not without challenges. So even if they have start earlier, the challenges are still there, but then the challenges are there not to scare us, but to be overcome, right? So I really like that statement and also, Transition start with ambition. So it's good that both countries have strong ambitions for EV charging, and uh, and 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 we appreciate that. Although the way to go from where we are today to to there, it's not an easy uh, an easy way, I would say. But then uh, we have plans here, and there are so many things that we can collaborate with, and. With that, I would like to close uh, this session. I would like to thank uh, uh, our distinguished speakers for all their time, their insight. They've prepared so much for the presentation. And I would like also to thank uh, everyone who comes and especially for those joining uh, from Indonesia. Uh, I, we hope that the program, this webinar give you valuable insights and we look forward to seeing you at, uh, at, at our next session. And until then, please stay safe, please stay safe and stay healthy. And I wish you a nice weekend. Thank you and bye-bye.